and welcome to The Travel Show with me, Lucy Hedges, coming to you this week from Rwanda. I'm in the capital, Kigali, to meet the people determined to make the country one of East Africa's cultural hotspots. How do I look? Good? <laughs> Cats in Copenhagen skiing on the roof of a power plant. <laughs> I just want to make it down without falling over. And Simon Calder's back with his tips on how to take a new train link to the world's coldest city. Yakutsk in northeast Siberia is now easier to reach. This week in Copenhagen. By 2025, the Danes hope this will become the world's very first carbon neutral capital city. We sent Catmo to find out how they're getting on. Denmark is a country that takes its eco friendly reputation very seriously. It's claimed more than two thirds of their waste is recycled, and 30% of all their energy consumption comes from renewable sources. They even say the harbour is clean enough for you to swim in. Not something I'll be trying on a cold winter's day. Instead, I'm on a go boat. It's one of a fleet of electric boats available to hire here in Copenhagen. It's charged back at the dock with solar panels. So that means no noisy engines and low CO2 emissions. This green drive has had another added push with the opening of a new tourist attraction. Built on top of the unlikeliest of buildings, a power station. Fueled by waste and billed as one of the most environmentally friendly plants of its kind. Opened last month, the Copen Hill spans more than 40,000 square meters. This slow pine one works its way from the bottom all the way up the side of the building and it's open every day of the week for hikers, sightseers and even skiers. The ski slope is made from a slippery synthetic material which is coloured green to stop the slope from discolouring. So they're still just doing a little bit of work up here but look, right over there that's Sweden, which is very cool. And on the other side, we have this amazing view of Copenhagen. And how did you guys come up with putting a ski slope up here? One of the things we, we realized quite quickly is that if you take a, a section of the building, it actually steps down from low to high, from the area where the trucks drive in to the, the furnace, to the boilers, the, uh, the flue gas treatment areas, all the way up to about 90 meters. And one of the, the other things about Denmark is that Danes love to ski, but Denmark is completely flat. So they will drive for three hours to Sweden to ski on a slope that's about 80 meters high. So we quickly realized that uh, since we have mountains of trash apparently, we could turn it into mountains of recreation and skiing that could become a public amenity in the, the very center of the city of Copenhagen. Sustainability tends to be this thing that's seen as a Protestant act. Sustainability is something you do which means that you have to do less of something and that you somehow have to have less life experience. But what we really wanted to, uh, to do with this project is to express that somehow sustainability can be something that's positive and fun and that actually gives more back to, uh, to people and to the, the city. Inside, a glass lift shows people the inner workings of the power station and tours are available as an après ski activity. So explain to me what's going on because there seems to be like a mix of 
leftover tree branches, but also general waste as well. That's correct. We receive waste from our five municipalities, both from households and from industries. You know, all the waste that cannot be recycled. How often do these trucks come? Because there seems to be a very steady flow, even just standing here for the past few minutes. <laughs> yeah, we have around 300 lorries uh, coming in on a daily basis. Inside the waste silo, giant grabbers mix the rubbish before dropping it into the furnace. So this is where the waste is being incinerated. I'll show you over here. It's, uh, it's quite a sight. <laughs> it is like staring into the pit of hell. <laughs> the plant generates electricity and potentially enough annual heating for 150,000 homes. We have waste in Copenhagen, we'll keep on producing waste in Copenhagen and you know in the rest of the world. So this is a, this is a product that's already here so we might as well use it for something reasonable, that is something that makes sense. Back on the slope, it's time for me to get my skis on. Can I borrow your boot for one moment? Yep. Just one of them. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't been on a dry ski slope for maybe 15 years. Well, you'll have fun. I've been on actual snow. Yeah, well, it's yeah. quite different. Speed is your friend up there, so. Go. Speed is my friend. Yeah. So I don't really know how this is going to go, or if I'm going to wipe out. <laughs> I just want to make it down without falling over. After that initial wobble, I was soon feeling confident. Maybe a bit too confident. <laughs> well, that went very well. And the Copen Hills open now to skiers of all abilities. If you're thinking of travelling to Denmark, here are some things we think you should look out for. If you're staying in Copenhagen, you could cycle to Tivoli Gardens. Established in 1843, it's one of the world's oldest and prettiest amusement parks. Plus, it's right in the city. Fairy tale writer Hans Christian Andersen is said to have visited many times, and it's rumoured Walt Disney found the inspiration to his own Disney World here. If you're feeling brave, you could take an icy dip off the northern tip of Denmark. It's the Skagen Winter Swimming Festival. Anyone who takes part earns the name of Icebreaker. Organisers promise it will be an atmospheric and invigorating event. All for something very different, Horsens Jail in the Jutland region is hosting a prison ink festival in May. 250 tattoo artists from around the world will be on hand to ink you up. Organisers are expecting around 5,000 people to attend over the three-day event. Now, Malaysians themselves admit that nothing unites their multicultural nation better than their food. So we're in Sarawak to see what goes into their unofficial, official national dish. That God. People know me as the laughing boss. We are at the banquet restaurant in Kuching, Sarawak. Today, I'm going to teach you how to cook basic nasi lemak with a few twists. Nasi lemak is steamed white rice infused with coconut milk. And basically, the most important part is the samba, the spicy signature special red sauce. Okay, first off, we're going to have the rice, do it with water. And this is the most important thing, the coconut milk. Nasi lemak. Without the coconut milk, you won't have the lemak. And then, this, pandan leaf. Just for the flavour, 
for the fragrance. When basically when it's ready, the smell will tell you. The fragrance will tell you. Now we move over to the samba, the big onion. Everyone can have nasi lemak. It's a typical Malay recipe. In the kampong, you sell this nasi lemak. I think two to three ringgit. You gotta make it simple, make it nice. Yeah, and if you want to sell it the five star hotel, you will name it a longer name. You will name it steamed white rice infused with coconut milk, seasoned with special spicy signature red sauce. Ah, that you can sell thirty ringgit. This one, two ringgit. <laughs> Perfect. This is golden brown. We will just add in this. This is the chili paste. And then the sour papaya and prawn paste. You can smell it from a thousand miles away. That's exactly how you cook a traditional basic samba. Okay. Yep. Okay, there we go. The cucumber slice, the deep fried anchovies, and there we have it, the perfect nasi lemak. Nasi lemak can go with anything, from fried chicken to Peking duck, or you can go to the basic. There you go. Hmm, the spiciness, the coconut milk, <laughs> awesome. Stick around because still to come on The Travel Show. Our global guru, Simon Calder, explores how to reach the world's coldest city by train. And I'm in Kigali, seeing how this city is transforming into a cultural hotspot. <laughs> I think I made it for about half of that choreography. Hello again. Today I'm focusing on a subject that more of you want to know about than any other, budget travel in Europe. I aim to help with seeing Dubrovnik on a shoestring, recommending the best Greek island for a cut price May escape and the tricky business of international rail travel. First though, as winter gets a grip on the northern hemisphere, the world's coldest city, Yakutsk in northeast Siberia, is now easier to reach. A new railway line connects the city to the rest of the Russian rail network, almost. The wide Liena River stops the line just short of the city, but in winter, when the river is frozen, vehicles take passengers the short distance from the end of the line to Yakutsk, and in summer, there are ferries. Back here in Europe, Bethan Hughes wants to know... I'm going to Dubrovnik with my boyfriend and we're both students. What places would you recommend to go on a budget? Dubrovnik and budget used to go well together in the same sentence, but Croatia's most beautiful city is now very firmly on the tourist trail. As a result, prices for everything from coffee to souvenirs have soared and finding bargains is challenging for eating, drinking, chilling and quite possibly sleeping, I urge you to consider Tsavtat, a spectacular 45-minute boat ride from the old harbour in Dubrovnik. This ancient town was once a Greek outpost, a Roman colony, and is now a backwater without the crowds and the high prices of Dubrovnik. Edward McGeary has a romantic plan for 2020. I plan to take my fiancé to a Greek island for rest and relaxation. I was looking at Crete, Kia and Santorini. I do like my comfort, however, I don't feel like paying ridiculous prices for the privilege. Do you have any suggestions? 
Hi Edward, and thanks for your question. To help you out with this, I've sought someone with specialist knowledge. One of the most romantic uh, Greek islands is the island of Milos. It's only four hours away from Athens by ferry. Uh, it has some of the best beaches in Greece and great cuisine. For your stay, I suggest either the town of Adamas or Polonia. Now, many viewers have got in touch to say they want to switch from air to rail, but some, like Ben Vost, say they're finding it very difficult to source international train tickets. We'd love to visit Stockholm by train. Interrail can sell us a ticket to cover Germany, Denmark and Sweden for up to seven days, but I want a travel agent to connect everything up for me. However, they want you to go everywhere by plane, which isn't very eco-friendly. Can you point me in the right direction? I have many years experience of organising rail travel in Europe and regretfully I still haven't found an agent who can successfully connect any two points on the continent. However, I hope I can help you reach the Swedish capital. Because you know exactly where you want to be when, I don't recommend Interrail. Instead, I suggest you use SNCF, French Railways or its partner Thales to get to Brussels. From there, German Railways can get you to Copenhagen in several hops but on a single ticket and Swedish Railways will go from the Danish capital to Stockholm in under six hours. The earlier you book and the more flexible you can be, the lower the cost. Wherever you're heading, I'm here to help. Just send in your questions, I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, the Global Guru, bye for now and see you next time. Rwanda has just topped the 2020 Africa destination list and I'm here in the capital, Kigali. The city is a hub for new startups, it has a buzzing art scene and great local entertainment. But while most travellers whiz through here to get straight to the Rwandan wildlife, I've come to see what the capital has to offer. <laughs> The city is impressively spotless, there's Wi-Fi everywhere, and perhaps most importantly, there's a real sense of pride bursting from every single person I talk to. This is thanks in no small part to the National Made in Rwanda initiative. It's a movement to support and inspire local businesses, and the Made in Rwanda label is now a badge of honour. This all reflects the new Rwandan identity, no longer divided along ethnic or tribal lines. I'm at the house of Teo, where designer Matthew Rugumba set up shop eight years ago, and he's seen his brand really grow in popularity since the launch of Made in Rwanda last year. He's even seen his clothes strutted on the red carpet of the premiere of blockbuster film Black Panther. I want to, to show the best of Rwanda. There's a lot of undiscovered talent here. It's part of my mandate to, to utilize as much local talent and expertise as I can. It's very important that we build a local ecosystem of models, photographers, lighting experts. Only when we do that, we can say that we have a local fashion industry. I'm dying to find out about the Wakanda premiere suit he made for the protagonist, Lupita Nyong'o's brother, Junior. The suit was made remotely and Teo worked off photographs working right down to the wire. It got to him about three or four hours before the actual premiere. Whoa, yeah, talk so, about cutting it fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, With your I, bloodshot eyes because you've not read, not slept exactly, for Exactly, and even when he got the suit, I wasn't sure it would fit. Yeah. So it was an absolute miracle that it fit. It was really exciting. It was an important time for Rwandan fashion. Teo and other city designers are not only thriving here in Rwanda, but are now selling their goods abroad. Fashion isn't the only thing that's growing here, thanks to the Made in Rwanda slogan. Now, music and dance has always been a way for people to express themselves. And now, with the National Revival, you can't go far here without hearing a drum beat. Inema is one of East Africa's largest art centres with a range of Rwandan cultural experiences. Yeah. How do I look? Good. I've noticed this real sense of pride to be Rwandan. Right. Why is this dance so symbolic of Rwandan culture? It's very essential for the kids to have um, 
some sort of identity and mm. then to grow understanding the dance, uh, uh, their culture yeah. is very good as you move forward. Well, I guess you can tell what's going to happen next. Oh man, here we go. So I've had so much fun today getting stuck into Rwandan culture. Now I'm ordering a cocktail, I'm about to kick back and enjoy a concert Rwandan style. I'm here to see Deo perform, one of Kigali's rising music sensations. The Inanga is our cultural traditional music. It's folk one, uh, it's our history, it's our identity. Uh, many years ago, it was getting disappeared. So I decided to introduce my music to the, to the new world. Such a beautiful sound. So pretty. The lyrics of your, of your music, what do they mean? What are, you, what are you saying in your songs? I want everybody to know our culture, how we're doing, uh, our history. Yeah. If everybody listen to our story, where we come from, and what we're going on, uh, it gives the inspiration to other nations. So mm. I want to tell the people about our country. This new generation of Rwandans who have now moved on from the country's darker, violent past are shedding light and colour across the country. And while most travellers rush through Kigali, it's worth keeping some time aside to explore the people, their passion and their crafts in this bustling city. Well, that's it for this week. Join us, if you can, next week when... Kat is back in Iceland where a new kind of sanctuary for beluga whales is getting ready for its residents. Oh, if you insist. If you insist. There we go. Oh, there's another little bat. <laughs> Catch that if you can, but in the meantime, don't forget, we are all over social media. So why not sign up to us there and join us out here on the road in real time and also share your travel stories with the rest of the world. Until then, from me and the rest of the team, it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>